Hello and welcome back. I picked my top five overclocks of the year. I want to show them to you in this video. Now I'm proud of mostly all of the videos that I make on this channel, but some projects are just more special than the others. Not necessarily because they get the highest views or the most attention, just because they're a little bit more exciting or interesting or whatever reason. They just feel a little bit more special. Anyway, let's have a look and let's start with number five. Number five already proves that it's not necessarily the videos that get the highest views that are my favorite projects. In Scatterventure number 55, I overclocked the Radeon graphics integrated in the Ryzen 7000 CPUs. Ryzen 7000 Raphael processors were the first AMD processors with integrated graphics, excluding of course their APUs. The AMD Radeon graphics of the Ryzen 7000 features the RDNA 2.0 architecture in its most miniature form with precisely one work group processor. That's seven fewer than the Radeon RX 6500 XT, so the performance wasn't that great. But the overclocking capabilities were pretty good. We were able to overclock the graphics core from 2.2 GHz to 3.1 GHz, resulting in a performance increase of slightly more than 40% in some benchmarks. The project makes it into my top five because I honestly didn't expect AMD to enable overclocking for the integrated graphics in the Ryzen 7000 CPUs. It's pretty cool. But what really sets it apart is the comments I received. The integrated graphics are a real value add even for people who use discrete graphics. Overclocking can help make the gaming experience just a little bit more enjoyable while waiting for your powerful discrete graphics to return to reasonable pricing or return from a repair. On number four is my 6.7 gigahertz overclock of the Core i9 3900KS processor. Now I know for most of you the 3900KS wasn't that exciting of a processor launch. After all, it was only a couple of speed bumps over the 13900K. But for sure, for Intel, this was a pretty special launch because it was the very first 6 GHz CPU out of the box. Judging by the video count on my Scatterventure guide, many of you also enjoyed the 13900KS and its overclocking capabilities. Scatterventure number 53 is the second most viewed video on the channel. I pushed the CPU to only 6.3 GHz in that video, but in my 13900KS launch video, we push it up to 6.7 GHz. Of course, we needed some special conditions to make that 6.7 GHz work. The first condition is that we exclusively use the P cores and disable all the E cores. That helps in two ways. One, in an all-core workload, the power consumption will be much lower. And two, we don't have to deal with those pesky E-core VF curves when fine-tuning the voltage. The second condition is that I use EK's Delta 2 tech and Intel's cryocooling technology to achieve sub-ambient temperatures. In unregulated mode, the Delta tech can lower CPU temperatures to 0 degrees Celsius. Of course, the much lower temperatures help improve the overclocking capabilities. The third condition is that we must use Intel's OCTVB toolkit to fine tune the P-Core frequency in various thermal scenarios. For this particular overclock, I had up to two P-Cores go up to 6.7 GHz when the temperature was below 10 degrees Celsius. The all-core frequency is 6.1 GHz up to 70 degrees Celsius and 5.9 GHz at 100 degrees Celsius. Obviously, that 6.7 GHz is only seen when we idle at the desktop. In gaming workloads like CSGO and Tomb Raider, the CPU frequency moves between 6.1 GHz and 6.4 GHz, depending on the scene and the operating temperature. This project is special to me because I feel like it's the ultimate expression of Intel CPU overclocking. We try to use all of the different tools available in our OC toolbox. It's just very cool to try and squeeze the CPU so much as we did with the 13900KS. Another reason why this project is dear to my heart is because this type of overclocking isn't purely academic or for show. It's actually possible to run this in a daily system as I demonstrated during the Intel Creator Challenge for which Elmore and I flew out to Los Angeles. Good, but now we're here with some overclocker masters. We have Peter. Hi, Peter, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So uh, we have Peter and we have John. 
Nice to meet you, John. Hey. Thanks. So uh, tell me, Peter, what do you have uh, today for us over here? So I am overclocking the 13900KS, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But that's I'm what doing we're doing with water cooling. But oh, not, nice. Not just regular water cooling. I'm making use of the EK Delta 2 Tech. So okay. it's a tech cooler that is powered by the Intel cryocooling technology. Do you want okay. And it allows us to go sub-ambient on the CPU temperature. So I'll Great. show you later on how much frequency I can get by can going get that. sub-ambient. So as you know, the KS CPU can run at stock, two cores up to six gigahertz, yep. and then all the cores at 5.6 gigahertz. Yes. We're overclocking, so we want to make it run faster. Correct. And what we're doing with this configuration here, we're saying by core usage, so based on the amount of cores, the amount of P cores that are active, mm -hmm. we're going to be running a different frequency. And I've configured it here that up to two active P cores, it will run at 6.7 gigahertz, so wow. 700 so gigahertz higher. I had, that's, the, that's amazing. It may come as a surprise to some of you that the 7800X3D is only my third favorite overclock of the year. The 7800X3D videos did exceptionally well on the channel. It's by far my most popular overclock. And yes, overclocking the 7800X3D was a lot of fun, but there are still two other projects that I hold in higher regard. That's not to say that overclocking the Ryzen 7 7800X3D wasn't a lot of fun. I think it was a great follow-up to my Ryzen 7 5800X3D overclocking guide from 2022. I consider the OC strategies demonstrated in Scatavenger number 60 as the most complete of all my Ryzen 7000 guides. That's because we use all the techniques available. Precision boost overdrive, curve optimizer, asynchronous e-clock, manual overclocking, and ASUS BIOS profiles. Asynchronous e-clock is by far my most favorite strategy for Ryzen 7000 CPUs. In asynchronous mode, there are two distinct external 100 MHz reference clocks. One clock provides the 100 MHz input for the CPU PLL, and the other provides the 100 MHz reference clock input for the SOC PLLs. That means you can increase the reference clock for the CPU cores independent of your CPU's other parts. Asynchronous e-clock is fundamental for AMD CPUs that either don't support overclocking or that have an F-max limit that's beyond what the precision boost and precision boost overdrive allow you to set. It often requires fine-tuning per core stability using a positive curve optimizer setting. In Scatterbencher number 60, I use the e-clock strategy to push the Ryzen 7 7800X3D to 5.4 GHz. All the CPU cores can achieve an effective clock frequency above 5.3 GHz. Two cores almost hit 5.4 GHz, and the Shamino boost curve has increased by 250 to 350 MHz compared to stock. I even teased 5.6 GHz at the end of the video. What makes overclocking the 7800X3D and 5800X3D so interesting is that we're going against the grain. We're doing things that we're not supposed to be doing. Nowadays, that always carries a little bit of risk because as overclockers and enthusiasts, we are entirely dependent on these chip manufacturers to enable overclocking for us. Suppose someone in the C-suite gets upset with enthusiasts doing things they're not supposed to, in that case, it's always a real possibility that overclocking gets shut down. That's a point I often refer to when highlighting ISOC. Let's hope it never comes to that. Before we get to my top two overclocks of the year, here are the honorable mentions. In March, I launched the EFC Scatterbencher edition in collaboration with Elmo Labs. The EFC SB is a customized version of the original Elmo Labs Easy Fan Controller, which I've used since Scatterbencher number 26. The product functions and features are the same as the original EFC, with here and there a tiny improvement. The most obvious difference is that this EFC version comes in the Scatterbencher color scheme, yellow, white and black. I also made a video on overclocking the 11th generation Core i9-11980HK Tiger Lake processor in August. This project is dear to my heart because the 10 nanometer Tiger Lake never came to the DIY desktop. Furthermore, it was my first time trying a motherboard from Er Ing, a non-Taiwanese manufacturer. Additionally, the BIOS options gave us a great insight into how Intel CPU overclocking works behind the scenes. 2023 was also the year of the return of overclocking high-end desktops. Both Intel and AMD released their high core count CPUs this year. 
They give us overclocking entertainment for up to 56 and 96 cores respectively. These overclocking projects are always interesting because they push the thermal solutions to their limit. On number two of my favorite overclock of the year are actually two cards, the Intel Arc A380 and the Intel Arc A770. These represent the upper end and lower end of the Intel Alchemist discrete graphics card lineup. Alchemist is the codename for Intel's first generation desktop discrete graphics. It uses the XEHPG variant of the Intel XE GPU architecture. The ARC product launch was pretty messy. I first acquired an ARC graphics card back in August 2022. To get my hands on a card, I had to purchase it from Jindong in China and import it into Taiwan. The only card available was from Gunnier, a vendor I had never heard of before. In 2023, I published Scatterventure number 44, covering the ins and outs of ARC A380 overclocking. At the end of the video, I made it clear that with the current state of overclocking enablement, we couldn't push the ARC A380 to its limit. I kind of hope that someday we will get the tools and the workarounds needed to push Intel Alchemist to the absolute limit. Today, even with regular water cooling, we're not even near the limit. And honestly, I thought that's where my Intel Arc overclocking journey would end. But then I got my hands on an Intel Arc A770. In Scatterventure number 64, published in July this year, I cover all the details about overclocking the Arc A770 with water cooling. In the final overclocking strategy, we overcome all the artificial limitations holding back the GPU and push it to 2.7 GHz. Since now the only thing holding back the GPU was cooling, I decided to try extreme cooling as well. In early August, I published my results, which included a near clean sweep in the 3 d Mark leaderboards and a maximum frequency of nearly 3.6 GHz. The Intel Arc overclocking projects are special to me for a variety of reasons. First, because this was totally uncharted territory. Together with Shimino, we had to build the Arc OC tool software ourselves to even get started. Later with the A770 card, I needed Elmore's help to figure out how to use the voltage regulator with his EVC2 device to work around some crucial power limitations. Getting Intel Arc to overclock and properly push to its limits was truly a collaborative effort. Second, it also showed me how passionate some folks at Intel are about overclocking and performance tuning. Starting with my very first video on the A380, all the way to the nitrogen-cooled A770, multiple people from Intel reached out to provide support and guidance where possible, even when it wasn't their job. Third, because we were one of the first to try liquid nitrogen on the Intel Arc. I wasn't the very first, as that honor goes to Reddit user Unbounded, but I believe I was the first to run the card without artificial limitations, thus seeing the true maximum performance capabilities. Lastly, because we pushed the GPU to almost 3.6 GHz. As I said before, this was Intel's first attempt at a discrete gaming graphics card in a very long time. And the fact that they're able to push it over 3 GHz is actually pretty remarkable. So clearly the ARC A380 and ARC A770 videos have a lot going for them. They're really special to me, but they didn't make it to the number one spot. And that's because we achieved something extra special just a couple of months ago. While 2023 was a year full of unforgettable overclocking projects, nothing beats getting to 9 gigahertz for the second time and seeing 9.1 gigahertz for the very first time. You just let us know when, when you're there. Yeah. Oh fuck, I'm gone. Uh, Did you try? I, I think I did. Okay, I we try, we try, we try, try, try. Two, one, engage. Locked. Fuck. We saw it, we saw it. Uh, we saw Being it. the first to hit 9 gigahertz almost precisely one year ago was already special. Still, this year's record is even more memorable on a personal level. Not only because we managed to surpass last year's record, but because it took so much energy to get there. 
Intel put up a great video documenting the record attempt, and I highly recommend watching that video. Overclocking with liquid helium is always a challenge because so many moving parts need to come together. You need a CPU with extraordinary cores, you need a motherboard that can deliver power in extremely cold conditions, and you need the right operating system to maximize the probability of success. Even with all that in place, things can still go wrong for an experienced team like ours. We had everything figured out for our first record attempt, and even beat the world record. But at the end of the session, none of our CPU-Z validations passed. All were rejected, so no record. Discouraged but not deterred by the setback, Asus approved ordering another 100 liter of liquid helium for the week after. During the weekend, Shimino, Sunho, Elmore and I worked from morning to late in the evening to find out what went wrong. At the end of the weekend, we figured out what went wrong, but didn't figure out a foolproof solution. So going into the Helium session on Monday, we had a plan, but no certainty that it would work. Fortunately, the cores were capable, and in the end, we managed 10 results surpassing the previous world record. However, only one also passed the CPU-Z validation. Now we should check the files, I think. Uh, but I Shouldn't we keep going? Should we check? Okay, check the files. Check the files. Sync, uh, check. Flash track. Sync, sync, and uh, move. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we got a lot of scores. Let's see. Yeah. Check the top one first. Last one first. Last one? Last one first. Yes, the last okay. one. Okay. Last one. Last one first. Oh, come on. Oh. <laughs> I hope it's clear now why this is my favorite project of the year. It's not just about hitting 9 gigahertz once again, and we're the only team that's ever achieved over 9 gigahertz, or seeing 9.1 gigahertz for the first time. It's that it took us so much effort and so much energy to get it done. It was truly a tumultuous emotional roller coaster of a week, and it was extra satisfying to have a win in the end, to actually get the new record in the end. To wrap up this fantastic year full of wonderful overclocks, I want to look forward and say that I'm pretty excited about what's coming in 2024. We're looking at Zen 5 and Arrow Lake, and those are two architectures that I'll definitely try to make overclocking guides for, just like I've done in the past with new architecture launches. I also want to thank you, the Scatterbencher community, for being so positive and uplifting throughout the year. Actually, most of the comments that I receive on my videos are pretty positive, so I really like that about the little space here that we're building. Also, a very special thanks to my Patreon supporters who support me with a little bit of extra cash so I can buy some of the components that I need for my builds. Anyway, that's it for me for this year. I hope to see you in 2024 for another set of overclocking guides. But now it's time to enjoy the end of the year with friends and family. Till the next time.